61A, Lecture 30, Q&A. Just before I started recording, we were talking about the first interpreter and compiler. Uh, I just did a quick Google search, and it, it, the first hit is with from Grace Hopper uh, talking about the first compiler. Uh, if, if you don't know who Grace Hopper is, you should search for her name um, and read about her. She's this really remarkable woman who was in the, was it the Navy, John? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, in the Navy, who was one of the most influential computer scientists in the early days. There's this great um, YouTube video of her, I think on David Letterman's show, talking about computers, and it's wonderful, just wonderful. She's fantastic. I never saw that. I should go find yeah, it. Yeah, look for Letterman, and I think it was Letterman and Grace Hopper. Let me, let me verify that. Yeah, it's Letterman. It's from the obviously like the '80s or something, and she she's fantastic. And Letterman is an idiot, um, which is you know what makes it so great. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, we can keep talking about Grace Popper. I can talk to her about her for like another hour. That's I'm fine with that. <laughs> By the way, for the for the young women on the on the call, there is a yearly Grace Hopper conference uh, for um, new computer scientists of all stages and it's a wonderful yearly program um, to attend. And many people from Berkeley go, so. Yeah, uh, yeah. and I there's, think there's often um, resources to help support uh, travel and- Yeah, so. there's support from the department, there's support from Grace Hopper Conference itself. Um, so people find a mix of ways to go, but a lot of folks do end up going. Yeah, before I got here, we used to send just dozens and dozens of students and they just, they wouldn't stop talking about it when they got back. Okay, so uh, this week's lab is about building an interpreter, just like a small one. So um, the one that you'll build is kind of like the calculator that we did on Friday, except for that it has one extra very important feature, which is that you can define procedures and then call them. So here's an example. Uh, is defining a procedure that adds X and Y, and then you add X and Y. Okay, not that exciting. Uh, but you could, for example, build a curried version of mole and then call it twice and then end up multiplying the values together. So um, there's this diagram which describes how you get from the input, that would be this, to the output, that would be this, which involves all these steps. So um, the lexer is the part that finds the individual pieces. Those would be the name add, the open parenthesis, the number three, the comma, the number four, and the close parenthesis. It does a little bit more than just like pick every character because, for example, it treats add as a whole name. And if you have the, well, we don't have any two digit numbers, but if you have a two digit number, it will treat it as just one thing. The parser is the next step. That takes as input the output of the lexer, which gives you all these different pieces, and builds an expression. And the expression is represented according to however the interpreter wants to represent an expression. But expressions are always tree structured, meaning like there's this whole expression, and it's made up of this uh, operator and these operand sub-expressions. And then eval does the work of evaluating the expression. So the nice thing about a parser is it gives you a tree structured thing and evaluation is a tree structured process. And what do I mean by a tree structured process? Well, in order to evaluate this, you have to evaluate this and this and this. So um, like every expression either is a primitive where you just evaluate it immediately, that's kind of a base case, or it's a combination like this is, or like this is one huge expression. And the way you evaluate this is you evaluate its parts. So that would be this part and this part and this part. And then if it turns out that the expression you've evaluated is a call expression, then you have to apply the value of the operator to the values of the operands. So the reason that this has arrows going back and forth <clears throat> is that sometimes the process of applying a function means you have to evaluate some stuff. And there's really only one case here. What you evaluate is the body of the expression you're applying. So eval the whole thing, 
means you have to eval that, eval that, eval that. Now you know you have a function and two numbers. You apply this function to those two numbers. What does that mean? Well, that means create a new frame where y is bound to three and x, oh, sorry, where x is bound to three and y is bound to five, and then eval the body of the procedure of the function. Once you hit the base cases and kind of pass their return values up, eventually you get the value of the entire expression, which is then automatically printed out. So that's the print part is really simple. It's just like make sure that whatever the value of this whole thing is, is displayed. Yeah, great question. So like when you're writing scheme and you're calling some F, you're calling it on uh, plus two, three, are there cases where you need to quote this or don't need to quote it? Like, what's the story there? Well, I'll give some simple cases first, and then maybe we can think of some other ones together. If you have a sub expression like this, this actually says call one as if it were a procedure, which is not. So the reason you often see a quotation mark before a list of numbers, for example, is that you'll get an error regardless of what f is, even if f isn't defined yet. Um, well, I guess then you'll get the error about f not being defined, but you know, whatever this is, absolute value, you're gonna have this problem that says int is not callable. And so you gotta quote that. Now this will still give you an error, which says that uh, uh, it doesn't like the way that we called abs, but um, Let's say we were doing something more useful like the coder of this list. Now we finally have something that works. Um, the simplest rule is if you're trying to do work in order to figure out what to pass in, then you shouldn't quote it. So if we're like building something up, then we don't need to quote that because we need to evaluate this whole expression in order to get the data, the list one, two, three, before we pass it in. And if instead we're just trying to pass data in directly, then we should quote it. So that's like covers most cases. And the only case that really doesn't cover is when you're trying to treat code as data, which occasionally people do in Scheme. And that's one of the interesting things about the language. It's also one of the things that's very new. So uh, don't worry if it's a, a little disconcerting now, but like um, you can't get the cutter of a number but you could get a coder of a list. And why might you wanna do this? Well, maybe what you really wanna do is like take this expression, but change the plus to a times. Well, you could do that by putting the time symbol on the front of the rest of two, three. So like this thing kind of thing is possible. You can build up expressions by treating them as lists, at which point you need to quote it. And here's probably the most tricky part about this whole quotation is when do you quote symbols and when don't you quote symbols? And the answer is, do you wanna pass in what this is bound to or do you wanna pass in the symbol itself? So if I didn't quote it, what I would be putting in this list is a procedure that multiplies, which isn't like something that would ever show up in the source code of a program. This is no longer an expression. This is some mixture of numbers and procedures and if what I really wanted was an expression, then I would have needed to quote it. So basically the story is with symbols, do you want to pass in the symbol itself or do you want to pass in what it's bound to? Um, if you want to pass in what it's bound to, then just write the symbol and it will be evaluated for you, meaning get the value of whatever it's bound to. And if you just want the symbol itself, then you have to quote it. And in Python, it's not exactly the same, but we have a similar type of construct, which is strings, right? When you put things in quotes, those are not interpreted. Those are literally passed around. It's not exactly the same thing as the quote, but that's same concept is that you're not interpreting what it is. You're just, you're in, in, encoding it, it directly. Yeah, exactly. Um, in the lecture videos, you introduce a new frame class to handle the scheme environment. Would it be possible to populate Python's environment directly or is that not possibly, or a bad idea? Is that not possible or a bad idea? Possible to populate Python's environment directly? Oh, I see. 
Yeah, it's a good uh, question. So, like, yeah. how would you create a Python frame to represent the scheme frame? Well, right. you'd make a Python function call. And so you'd make this Python function call with the right formal parameters and the right arguments. And then you would get a Python frame somewhere in the Python interpreter. Mm -hmm. But you can't really refer to that Python frame. All you can really do is use it to look up Python names. So the reason why in the scheme interpreter that we use here, we're going to explicitly represent frames using dictionaries is that you can give a dictionary a name. You can write code in Python that says, here's exactly what I want to do with this uh, frame. I want to use it next. I want to pass it in to apply. I want to look up a name within it. I want to bind a new name within it. Like you have full control. Whereas if instead you were trying to use the Python interpreter's notion of frames, the only way to create one would be to call a Python function with the right arguments. And you'd have to like create a function that has the right uh, formal parameters. But then even then you couldn't really do anything with that frame. You couldn't give it a name and pass it around and say, oh, I want to add one more symbol to it or something like that. That's a cool idea though, John, that you could use frames as objects that you could sort of move around and say evaluate in this frame. Right, and uh, Scheme has a feature that does exactly this um, that we don't talk about. It yeah. wasn't even covered in the version of 61A back when everything was in Scheme. This is kind yeah, of like a very- I remember that, topic. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, there's this, there's this notion of, um, yeah, calling, uh, you can call something w in a particular environment and have a symbol bound to that environment and you can pass environments around. So like in Python, we say functions are first class, meaning we can give them names, they can mm -hmm. be arguments, you can do anything that you want. Well, in scheme, environments are first, first class too, if you really set it up that way. Um, and uh, why would you ever want this? Well, it turns out it might be useful for building an interpreter. The most common way that it is used is actually to implement something like an exception mechanism, because mm -hmm. like then, you know, exceptions are all about deciding kind of what environment to go to next when something goes wrong. And you could try to do that in scheme just, just by like writing the rules of how exceptions work as long as you're allowed to give a symbol to a particular environment. Yeah, great question. So the question is, every time you apply a user-defined procedure in scheme, you're creating a new frame, but how do you keep track of all the non-local symbols, like uh, the rest of the environment? And uh, it's a great question. You can do this in Scheme. And the answer is that this new frame that you create knows about the frame that was the current frame when that procedure was defined in the first place. And therefore, the frame that you create gives you access not only to the local symbols, but also the non-local symbols. And um, yeah, I, I guess we told this story early on of what an environment is. It's a sequence of frames. It's got some first frame, and then it has a parent, and then it has a parent, and then it has a parent, eventually you get to global. And that is exactly the same story that applies to scheme, and that is the structure that you build, is that when you build a new frame, it has a parent, which is some existing frame, and it has a parent, which is some existing frame, or eventually you get to the global frame, which has no parent at all. And when you look up a symbol, well, you look in the first frame and if it's not there, then you check the parent. So basically you're just writing code to um, simulate that whole story about environment diagrams that we've been telling since the beginning of the course. And to do that, you have to create a frame object, which doesn't just have the local names, it also has a parent. <laughs> and there's a follow-up uh, here, does non-local even exist? I don't remember covering it in Scheme. Mm. So, so there's no non-local assignment that we'll talk about. It does exist, but we just left it out because we've got to leave out some things. If you really care, it's called a set exclamation point. But there is non-local lookup in the sense that if I uh, define uh, f of x, which returns a procedure that takes y and adds x and y together, and then uh, I call f on two and I call add two on five, I should get seven. 
what ad two has done is been bound to some procedure that really has two parts. You can only see one, you can see the code, but there's another part to it, which is what is the frame that was the current frame when this was created? It was a frame in which X was bound to two. So that's why this adds two. It doesn't just add anything together. Um, X is kind of like filled in already. And so um, the name X here is non-local. You obviously don't see it there. Where is it? Well, it's in the enclosing uh, scope. John, when you print out add two, why wouldn't it show me the binding of X to two? Would, isn't that what would have happened in Python? It would, it would, have, been, it would have shown that as, as plus two, uh, two Y? Uh, good question. I think you, you, in Python, you don't get these substitution effects because there's mutation everywhere and stuff could change. So really it is just storing the code and the environment. In the environment, yeah. In this subset of scheme that we're working in, it would actually be legal just to kind of replace this X with a two and, and like nothing would break as long as there's no mutation because that's that whole story of uh, you could replace an expression by its value without changing the answer. Um, so that would be like a nice feature is how do you display this such that uh, the X is filled in, but we didn't try to implement this. Okay. But the way the scheme interpreter actually works is it really just remembers the code and the procedure. And so when it evaluates this, it evaluates the plus and the X and the Y and it finds the plus in the global frame. It finds the X in the F frame and it finds the Y in the Lambda frame and puts them all together. And remind, remind me, John, is, am I misremembering that Lisp doesn't have the set exclamation mark um, oh, it operator. Does. It does. It does. I think it was all, always. Okay. Uh, so, some kind of. There's some version of Lisp or Scheme that has said we're not allowing this. Is that? Yeah. Maybe in the early days there was only set car and set cooter. That's what, yeah. There used to be only, that's what I, yeah. And not set bang. And so if you wanted to mutate something, then you had to build a cons. This right. might be the case. And, um, yeah, and then what about disallowing mutation entirely? I think that was never really a Lisp thing. That's more of like a Haskell thing. Oh, maybe that's why I'm confusing it with Haskell. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I suspect you'll have more questions when you actually do the scheme project. You know, this lecture was really just kind of giving you an overview of what's going on in the project. If you ever get to the point in the project where you're wondering like, what am I doing right now? Like it tells me, you know, I'm on question eight and it's telling me I'm supposed to implement this function, but why? I don't understand it at all. Not, that's a good time to refer back to this lecture and try to orient yourself or to just try to read the code for the whole project. Because, um, you know, this is where a lot of stuff in the course comes together. Like we learned about trees because expressions are tree structured. We learned about linked list because you know, this sequence of frames in an environment is like a linked list. And we learned about how execution works in Python. It's pretty much the same in Scheme. And now you really get to just write all those rules in code. So it turns out that everything that you like crammed into your mind in the first uh, few weeks of the course, now you just write a program that does it for you. You still have to think about it in order to write code. But what's cool is that it really is just a sequence of deterministic steps. And you can prove that to yourself by by writing an interpreter that does those steps and it, and it makes the programs behave like they're supposed to behave. So yeah, don't, don't miss that part. Don't miss that forest through the trees as you work through the project, but instead, you know, try to figure out what's going on and ask questions if you don't get it. All right, thanks everybody. Have a great start to the week. I think Wednesday is a holiday, right, John? And Wednesday's a holiday, that is true. Good. Happy Veterans Day, and we'll see everybody on Friday. All right. See you, folks. Bye.